start sure. broadcasting yet you want to share the whole desktop That's fine. sure yeah. oh sorry uh, let me just see whether yeah you can pass it yeah, 
password. So, uh, so people can actually join remote. So that's why. Uh, so did you actually make it? Yeah. Live now? Is it yeah. actually live now? It's a lot, well, I don't know if I should be broadcasting that. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to why, why am I broadcasting that that the code? <laughs> <laughs> Fine, whatever. Yeah. You can actually press it. Oh, okay. I don't know why. Can you mute your okay. awesome? Okay. Cool. I think this should be fine. Yeah, I think this should be fine. Okay. Oh. So uh, you can talk uh, like probably five ten minutes and uh, like take your time. You can talk. I think Kennedy is gonna take the time, right? So we'll go on get her. You can you can carry, start. That's fine. Oh, you sure? Oh, okay. yeah. I thought we were gonna wait till. You can wait for some more time. You can start interacting. Though. Why are we getting the echo? Uh, I, I, for some reason, I thought we were um, we're starting to listen. So, if we start interacting, like we can start at seven. Okay. Uh, probably we can even well begin at that time. But you can just start interacting, asking them questions, anything you want to do. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Or do you want me to do the presentation? You think everybody's here? Sure. Yeah, I, I think we have a good number, but if you want to start even later, that's that's fine. We have a good number. Okay. All right. I'll just check the okay. In uh, Kennedy's number, we'll go pick him up. Oh, here he is. Hey, Bill. Uh, he's saying there. Okay. Hey, uh, where are you? Oh, okay. We'll just come and uh, get you. Actually, you can ask him to give you a pass. We'll come in the meantime. Is he at? Are you at the fourth floor? Yes. Okay. Are you outside or are you in the Google office fifth floor? Okay. Okay. Just give me two minutes. We'll come there. Yeah. Just give me two minutes. I'll go get him. All right, bye. You going? Yeah. Is he on the fourth floor? He's outside. He's outside. You can see it's fine. So I think we're going to get started soon. Uh, Bill Kennedy, our main speaker, is um, outside trying to get through security, so he's here. <laughs> so he'll be here soon. I'm Van, in case you didn't know. <laughs> Probably pretty obvious. <laughs> <laughs> I recognize a few faces from the weekend. 
uh, at GopherCon uh, in, in Goa. Uh, so I can't decide whether to go ahead and do my little spiel or wait for uh, for uh, Bill to go first. I'm kind of hoping to go after Bill. Well, maybe I should yeah. go before Bill. You know, well, how good Bill is. <laughs> uh, you know, it's been, it's funny, I haven't been to India since, I've only been here once before, it was in 2011. I'll tell a funny story to kill a little time while waiting for Bill, so. Um, uh, so, you know, I, I, when I do travel, a lot of times I won't always like exchange all the currency before I get home. So I had a little bit of currency, actually more than just a little bit. Uh, I had some 500 notes from 2011. I hadn't been I hadn't been to uh, to uh, India since and I hadn't been following what's going on in India around money, you know. And so I, and I get in the airport and I'm like I'm, I'm hurrying to catch the shuttle to get to the conference and I want to miss it. I'll, I'll get some money later because I got this money. I got these three five hundred notes in my pocket, so I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> and so. So I, so I didn't need to use them that night, you know, but then the next morning I'm getting breakfast at the, the second hotel that I was at and, and they had paid for breakfast, but, <coughs> excuse me, but I wanted some bottled water because I'm trying to, I don't know what the term in Indian is for mom, just in with revenge, but one of the theories is stick to the bottled water, you know, so it turns out that wasn't part of the complimentary breakfast, so. <coughs> Yeah, I had to pay for that. And so I said, of course, so here's my 500. No, and they're like, no, no, no. And it was one of those places that didn't take credit cards, they needed cash. And I'm like, I don't have any cash. And it's, and it's, <coughs> it's in the US. And of course, you know, in the US though, when you get cash, you usually go to an ATM and you get $20 bills. So all I have was US $20 bills to pay for my bottle of water. <laughs> And I felt bad because like I didn't have the little currency and they're like and, and the but and so finally I said, Oh hell, here, take the twenty dollar bill. And I said, Give me another bottle of water. So I got another big bottle of water if I was gonna give it's just because I didn't I didn't I didn't know what to do and I just wanted to get out of there. But I, I didn't actually know at the time that not only was it not valid, but like it's actually like illegal. But I mean I didn't know it was illegal, so I don't think I'd get in. <laughs> but but, but uh, please don't tell your friends. <laughs> I've already burned the bill, so. <laughs> but that's how long it's been since I've been here before. But, uh, maybe I'll tell a little bit of my st story. Uh, this is, I don't really need the slides anyway. But anyone that just came in, this is the Google Guest uh, Network password. You can get on the network here. Oh, on it. Not tweet about my uh, having illegal currency in the country. <laughs> um, it may just a little bit about my background before we get started, in case people don't know. Um, actually, are there any Google Developer Group folks? Any people know about Google Developer Groups here? Oh no, oh one person. So uh, that's a program that I helped start uh, back in 2008, and I joined Google in 2010 to run that program. And there's actually quite a few Google developer groups here in India. But globally, there's uh, now uh, approaching 900 groups in almost 130 countries. And they have a, they have a network on uh, Meetup Pro. So if you go to meetup.com slash pro slash GDG, you also see that they have more than half a million members. So well, that was my first gig at Google that I did for four years. And then uh, uh, I, I tend to like to start things and not, not as good at uh, carrying them on you know i'm probably the, in the startup profile of the person to start the company but when it gets big and successful that's when you want somebody else to run it so i someone else took over the ggg stuff and i was <clears throat> doing some other work at google and then i decided i really was missing working with developer communities and this opportunity to work with the go developer community came along so um i probably won't work with most of you because like what i tend to do is meta community work and what I mean by that is I work, I organize the organizers. <laughs> so uh, so uh, Dinesh and the other folks here that are on the group are the kind of folks that I work with and I try to help them so that they can help you, you know, to be successful with, with the Go language. Um, uh, uh, I don't know if you guys are on the Slack, on the Gopher Slack, anyone on the Gopher Slack? Yeah, yeah, that's a good, 
place to hang out. I've been lurking there so far, uh, but uh, you'll start to see me more on the uh, meetup organizers' channels there. So I'll, be, I'll be interacting with the organizers. And we're going to start organizing some monthly hangouts for the people that run these groups to, to share information with them and best practices to help them run their groups better. That's kind of the stuff I do. Uh, so I, I work with the community, uh, particularly the organizers, to help them. Uh, um, and what they do and but I also am working now with specifically with the go team and my previous one I worked with all the technology so I didn't go very deep so um, I have to bear with me I'm still new to go so you guys can like probably code circles around me and, and go but I, I actually am a developer I, I have a degree from MIT in uh, electrical engineering because they didn't have a CS degree back then but it's uh, my concentration is in computer science uh, uh, and I've been, I was actually a developer for almost 30 years in Silicon Valley before I decided I enjoyed this community thing uh, even more than the programming uh, itself. So, yeah, so uh, my background's more in Java. The funny thing is, for me, I, I, I know that the people that, at least I shouldn't say this generally speaking, but I know that some of the people that write Go are not big fans of Java, you know. It's, it's big bloated language, but you know, I was there at the beginning of Java, and the, the people that were creating the Java language, they had the same, very similar motivations to the people that created the Go language. Everybody's still trying to get away from C++. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, serious, I'm serious, I mean, the C++ was the thing, like, like, like there's gotta be a better way when they were writing, you know, Java was like a, a true object-oriented language as opposed to whatever C++ is. And, uh, you know, and, and just had memory management and, you know, that stuff. And, and, uh, and the language initially was quite simple. It's just they had a different philosophy about evolving the language than Go does. Go has been very, and I think, you know, has, has paid off for the language. I mean, you look at Go 10 years in, you know, and it's still, a, a, you know, like I was talking to a developer at the conference and he was saying one of the reasons in his, uh, in his company uh, that does work for other companies building applications, and they had done a lot of their web applications in Ruby and they were starting to branch out and do more and more of their work in Go. They're still doing Ruby, but they're also doing Go now. And part of it is it's just like, you know, you can get up to speed. If you're, if you're an experienced developer, a good experienced developer, you can get up to speed in Go even if you've never written a lot of Go code in a couple of weeks. Because it's that it's that kind of language, you know, and uh, I think that was the original intention with Java, but it's not that way anymore. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, so yeah, they're still getting built here. So I, maybe I will go ahead and put my slides up. Um, so yeah, I'm a I like to consider myself an advocate for the community. So I mean, I get paid by Google, but uh, I'm trying to find the win-win where. You know, I mean, I'll be honest with you, be transparent. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, my success will be partially measured on the adoption of Go in the community, but also partially measured on the adoption of Google Cloud Platform. And so kind of, you know, part of it's out of my control because of what, uh, part of what has to happen is Google has to make Go support best in class for writing cloud applications, you know, uh, Period, and you know, Go has been so has been a successful language to the point that it's got on a you know Amazon's radar, and it, they have they have excellent support of Go, and so we have to we have to do even better. And so you know, I did that. I want I wanted to convince you that Go is the right language. I, mean, I don't need to convince you about Go because you're all here as your Go developers. I'm going to convince you that you know the right place to be running your or the best place to be running your Go code is on Google Cloud Platform. And I don't have the I'll be honest. I mean, we're not there yet. But we're 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 uh, striving to get there, and uh, always happy to you know you can you can find out what I'm doing by uh, following me on Twitter at at Van Riper, and I'm 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 here to listen and 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 get ideas from you guys on how we can make it even better. Um, oh, this is this is me at a Google Developer Group Summit at Google I/O. I was I already told you about my background doing that work. Um, if you want to find out more about what I do as a meta community manager, there's actually a nice little video interview I did. It's very informal. I didn't even know what they're going to ask me, and they just asked me and I required answers about what, what I do and why I do meta community work. And it's only like 10 minutes long. 
So uh, instead of giving you that whole 10 minute spiel, you can go check that out if you're curious. I'll, I'll, if, and it, the only thing I have to really remember is that Ben Riper because I'll probably, I'll tweet out a link to this later. <laughs> um, I mentioned Gophers. You're gonna see me on Meetup Organizers more going forward uh, channel. And one thing I was gonna say is, uh, who's heard of Go Cloud? Oh yeah, you gotta go check it out. So there's a little short link. Uh, that's actually a blog post that was written last July about it. And so the idea around, behind that project is to take uh, common cloud application programming functionality and encode it uh, written in Go and you don't have to worry about the, the uh, implementation details of whether it's, Am it's, whether it's Amazon or Azure or Google Cloud. And it'll, it's going to be architected so that people can plug in support for other providers, you know, it, it, for smaller ones as well. But we'll make sure that the top three are always supported on any functions that are part of the Google Cloud, uh, Go Cloud uh, API. And uh, it's, it's on GitHub. That's not the GitHub link. That's going to take you to a nice blog post, but then the blog post will point you to the GitHub project for it. It's out there. You can start to play with it. I don't think I don't think they say it. I don't think they would say it's ready for production. But that this is like the time to get in and play with it and give them feedback before it's uh, you know it, it reaches that 1.0 level. So I, I would uh, you know for me just now getting into Go, learning about it. That's I think separate from like things like modules and new stuff for. 2.0, <laughs> whether it's called 2.0 or not, <laughs> uh, uh, features. Uh, Go Cloud, is, in addition to that, is like an interesting thing to check out. So, um, yeah, so I'm, uh, I'm here to listen. <laughs> That's why the, when they said, when you give a talk, I was like, well, I could, I can talk a little bit, but. You know, I'm here, I'm still learning myself. You know, I'm not, there isn't a lot. I'm not gonna, most of you probably know more about programming and Go than I do at this point, because I just started uh, in November. Um, uh, but uh, I'm here to listen. I'm gonna move that so we don't, so, yeah, I'm here to listen. So I don't know why it's taking Bill so long. I'm gonna start tap dancing, but well, I'll also take, <laughs> uh, but I'll also take questions. So this will be a good time to, yeah. Oh, there! Speak of the devil. There is a large queue of people coming up. <laughs> uh, so. Oh no! I made the, like, maybe I shouldn't have done my spiel. I already did my spiel, Bill. I didn't hear it. So, was it a good spiel? <laughs> <laughs> Dude, you started without me. Well, they wanted to, the, the natives were restless. I get it. It's you can you can come up over here. Does anybody remember what Matt said? <laughs> 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 I'm here to listen. Hopefully, if we got one thing from, from that balance, I'm here to listen. Yeah, yeah, listen to uh, He's here. Yeah, we're playing audio you kind of. <laughs> <laughs> we have to break him in, you know? Yeah, Bill's here to talk. I'm here to listen. Yeah. He's used to the Java community, right? He's used to the Java community. Hey, I already came clean about Java, okay? Chance, then someone had raised their hand. Yeah, well, it's already shared. You can go. You can take over. You can start. I like this. Uh, 
you want to officially start? I don't, you can just take over. Well, I kind of feel like I, I, I said I was here to listen, so I don't want to like then <laughs> say, okay, I'm done listening. So like, there was, someone had raised their hand, so I'll, I'll look the question. I just wanted to ask how much uh, Google is meaning to for this for the tsunami. Like uh, they have done. Uh, well, I mean, there's a, we have a big investment internally, so we do use it heavily internally. I mean, I, I can't talk specific projects, internal project stuff, but, um, but yeah, you I made it. I learned that uh, because of some decisions, by the way, not to make a lot of investment so initially, but how is it now? Well, it was never the idea that Go was going to, like, replace C++ usage, you know, completely in the company. It was it, it, it was it was largely the idea of the people where this wasn't like we're gonna like root out C plus plus or whatever other language you want to choose for that. It was about like going forward new projects because I mean when you got legacy code, I mean they're not gonna rewrite the, the search stuff that's written in C plus plus. Fifteen years, it, it, uh, you know that code is we're, we're, that, that's uh, that's gonna go to. The grave that way in that language. <laughs> so I, I could tell you it's probably safer for me to answer this question. <laughs> Look, if you're from what I've been told, if you're a Google developer, you get to choose pretty much the four languages right now. Go, Java, C plus plus and Python. Those are the four. Now if you're doing front end stuff, Go just uh, Google just um, put out a one dot oh of uh, what what is it? What? Yeah. And that's like they found the reason to keep Dart around, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so I really thought that was dead. It's like it keeps it's like it keeps coming back. <laughs> so you know, from a, from a back end perspective, those are kind of your four languages. So I from what I've been told, you're not kind of like told what you want to use. And there's a huge Java community. There are some amazing DevRels out there right now doing Java who so it's really cool. So I don't think it's a matter of we'll go come in and replace it. I think teams get to choose what they think is the best tech to solve the problems that they're solving. And look, let's let's be real, right? Like C++ is still always going to be around because there are going to be things you want to build that just have to focus on pure performance, right? And there's no way around it. And honestly, Java's proven itself to be a performant language, has it not? Probably more Java programs running in production than anything else. So that ain't going away. And Go isn't about writing the most fastest, most performant programs anyway. What is Go about? Writing things that are fast enough, right? Even at Google scale, fast enough. So, you know, that's what we're looking at. It's still about what? Being productive over anything else. So I don't, I don't think that, I understand the question, but I don't think it's the question that we want to be asking. We want to be asking, are we allowed as developers to experiment, prototype, and find the right tools to help us solve this problem, not just for today, but for tomorrow? And I think that's what Google's doing at least right now by saying, let's make Go an option for developers amongst all the other ones. And I want to take your question in a different direction. So I think you're I, reading in, into that question. That would be like, uh, how committed is Google to Go? Yeah, because I see that uh, now people are starting a new project, not Google, but in the technology. They choose to go also. Who is a, one of the best options against Java and all that? Right. I'm just saying that how Google is internally giving that as a priority. So, yeah, so what I was saying is what was the level of commitment? And I just want to say that the commitment is high. I mean, they hired me. I mean, they were hired. <laughs> 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 no, 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 so I mean, by the team. Yeah, yeah. But I'm seriously, <laughs> ser seriously, <laughs> the, 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 I can't, I won't say names, but like someone very high in. Uh, we just met with someone very high in developer relations and someone very high in products and cloud, and they were like, "Tell us, tell us, tell us what you're going to do, and we'll give you the resources to do it." So there's, it, the commitment is there. There's a public talk by Samir and Mali on ACM. Yes. About uh, budget future going on. Let's go. Okay. Share the link. Yeah, there, there, there are a lot of projects. Yeah. I think it started with YouTube and Facebook and Kubernetes and Docker were both written in Go. The download server, when you download things off Google like Go, um, that's, in fact, that was one of the best projects that we had because we built the download server and we started finding some pods in the jetpack. 
that can improve. So I think one of the most brilliant things is that the teams at Google are using the same runtime as we are. They don't have their own version. So when they have Google scale issues with Go, they fix it. And guess what? They get the advantages of that. Some of the teams have built-in runtimes, which they are still testing out. But they've spoken about that in academics. Yeah, but the only real runtime that's different would be the one on the cloud. Yeah. And they're not going to talk too much about that. They need that extra cloud integration. Right? And Just sometimes that lags behind. Just to add something about that, uh, the dl.google.com. So uh, many times I used to see Hacker News when people used to talk about, hey, we are using Go in this startup, right? There would always be a comment, probably rank one, where they would be saying that, are you sure about this choice? Google themselves are choosing something else, right? And, and that this was like 2015 to 2017. I used to see this pattern a lot. But uh, the talk about the, and the slides which Brad Fitzpatrick had put out mm -hmm. about his rewrite of DL.com did a lot because he was essentially talking very publicly about how there was an agency customer service which he went and replaced with the Go service. And that was sort of an outward signal from Google that, hey, we are going to. Right. So that maybe you'd like to hear more about the things that are being done right. in early Google with Go. So, so I know you guys are using Google a lot, right? But if you could find some examples and highlights, that would help a lot. What's that? Oh, yeah, I'm done with my laptop. Okay. I'm just listening. <laughs> <laughs> you can you want to hear some? So yeah, yeah, do what you need to do. Really here. Like, I'm in Singapore. I'll go out and party, guys. Like, <laughs> like, it's okay. And eventually, the team will talk to management and then they decide, yeah, okay, maybe we should run this. So, even though we're laughing about the question, it's like, it is a serious question. I mean, I, and I, and I tell a lot of Java developers all the time, I go, look, this is about, you know, replacing Java just to write Go, right? I mean, you have a language that's just going to be self performant, productive. You know, it's not a language I particularly want to code in because I don't believe in the idioms and the philosophies behind it. I'm not a big true believer in getters and setters. You guys want to write that kind of thing? <laughs> but if you don't buy in to a language engine, a language's engineering choices and idioms, you shouldn't be coding in that language. And it's not because it's a bad language, it's because it doesn't fit your design philosophies, right? It's like Java doesn't fit my design philosophy, it doesn't make it something that is necessarily wrong. So uh, I have this conversation with people. I'm like, I'm going to show you the language, I'm going to tell you how it's engineered, I'm going to show you how to think about it. And it's going to be completely different. It's not object oriented programming or data oriented programming. But if I answer that, and if you don't, it's okay. Like, it's no big deal, right? Like, stay on Java, you're going to have a long career. You know what's going to happen? Oh, this is great, man. So you realize that, um, yeah, you realize that 
all of the COBOL programmers pretty much on the planet right now are retiring. <laughs> <laughs> they are at the age of retirement, they're in their mid to late 60s. Do you realize how much legacy code we are still dependent on that's running on AS 400s? So I have a proposition, especially if you're young. If you want to retire within the next 10 years, get out of this room and start learning COBOL. <laughs> Because you're going to get about three or four hundred dollars an hour for the next ten years, while we all still continue to try to figure out how to get off these systems, which we can't because all the bugs are now features, <laughs> <laughs> and there's no unit tests. And the only way to validate that your thing's even working is by running two systems at once and comparing outputs and database. Right? <laughs> so if you're really looking to get rich quickly, Cobalt meetups in <laughs> I'm seriously thinking about switching languages right now. Man, I'm old. I'm tired. I don't want to retire in five years. I want you guys to find me on a boat in Miami. I can, you know, <laughs> Japanese whiskey. That's it. And I'm joking here, but it, like, sorry, I'm not really joking. I'm like, oh, well, they're all retiring. So I'm learning that AS400. Now, we're still going to wait a few minutes before we get started. So I've got a group of a lot of new gophers in here. I love that because you experience guys think you know it all. And then you guys make it harder for me to have to teach. But the new the newbies are like the best. Look at this. It's my gopher back like that. Isn't that nice? Oh wait. There we go. We got these at gopher con. Like what am I supposed to do with a gopher showing his back? On the back of my there we go. Fine, right? <laughs> <laughs> real estate. That's the only one there. And that's it. I had this guy in a class one time because you know I'm giving out stickers all the time. He's putting them all on the back. And I'm like, Gee, what are you doing? Why you can see me doing exactly? You know? <laughs> <laughs> I just don't have a closet sticker collection or something. You know? I wish I had more stickers for you. I was uh, in Go and they wiped me out completely. So I got, I got a few though. Maybe I don't know if I have enough in this room, but I have a few. So I love my newbies because. I kind of get to show off a little bit about why I love the language. And there's tons of things I can do with you. I can teach you guys a little something. But I feel like showing off. Can I show off tonight, man? But it's not me showing off. I'm going to show off the language, OK? How many of you uh, feel really comfortable with the profiling in the language? How many of you really work with profiling? My friend over here, you've been using it a little bit. How long do you been writing code and go? Seven or eight years, go developer, you work with Google, you were doing before 1.0. Wow, you and I haven't talked, man. He's ready to listen, right there. <laughs> I want to talk to you. It's only one other person that I've ever met that I know that can make that claim. So that's super interesting, man. You're not going to talk because there may be other tech that you know about we can invest in right now. So he's heard it, right? But, okay, so once you, if you've seen some of the profiling and the tracing, you really don't get to use it day in and day out, right? So why don't we show off a little bit of, of the tooling, and, and along the way, we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about concurrency, sort of think about concurrency, we'll do all the fun stuff that we get to show off on the line, which is stuff you're not supposed to be doing day in and day out, right? Like, concurrency and multi-threaded software development is very complex, so don't do it. And some people believe it's not even possible to do it. I agree with that. This stuff's so complicated. I like to sleep at night. I don't know about you. I don't add extra complexity in any lot of software. I like to sleep at night. You like to wake up with green one? When I was as young as you, 18, I didn't care. I wanted to wake up. I'm like, oh, I want to work for three days straight without sleep, right? Not anymore, man. I like my sleep. That's my main motivation to write software that works. People ask me what I do. You know what I tell them? I write air conditioners. I'm like, what? I go, yeah, 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 I build, I build air conditioners. But like, I don't understand. You know, everybody's in this room. They're super comfortable right now, right? Has anybody thought about the air conditioning at once? One thing at all since the time you've been in this room? No. But if that thing breaks down, what's going to happen? It's not going to matter what I'm doing up here. Your brain's going to be going, why did it break? And who's coming to fix it? <laughs> the room stops. Everything stops. Well, guess what? The services that I'm building, if they break, what happens? Everything stops. The reality is if somebody knows my name, I have failed. I fail. I build air conditioning. I don't want anybody to know they even exist. They're just there and they're running. If you want to be popular, you become a front end dev. 
You want people who's in the house? You want people to know your name? Be a front end dev. That's what that's for. But I promise you, you're going to spend two weeks working on a screen and you're going to show it to somebody, and the first thing they're going to say is, I don't like that there. <laughs> Dude, I spent three days getting it there. <laughs> I'd be in jail if I was a front end dev, man. I can't say that. So I'm on the back. You want to be a back end dev? Then your goal is that nobody knows. Your name. Then you're being successful. I mean, your teammates are going to be doing it. That's the attitude you've got to have, right? Guys are like, no, dude, I want my Twitter followers. I'm going front end. Dark, dude. Dark. That's the new language for the front end. You've got to replace JavaScript. Right. You, think, you, you all laugh. I'm telling you, it's going to happen. All right, how much are we cutie that you still have outside here? I still got to get this thing connected. I need adapters. Do you have adapters up here? That's okay. I got adapters. I got so many wires going through Indian airports. It takes an extra hour just to empty the bag. You know, in the U.S., they don't care about wires. In India, I could walk around with water, but no, nope. wires get me in trouble. All right, here we go. So I just discovered that Mumbai is my favorite airport of all time. I used to fly to New Delhi. That was a nightmare. Like Mumbai was amazing. Where is my adapter? Oh, here we go. Here we go. One time I lost a bag of wires and adapters like this in an airport, and I cried. It cost me 200 US to replace everything I had. And I was like, I, and I, I lose things all the time, so I don't know. All right, we got an adapter. That's good. Here we go. And this is my HDMI. All right, let's get this thing up here. Let's see. We got this. We got. There's somebody remote? Yeah. Wow, they can't see me. Yeah. Wait, you're recording this too? Yeah. <laughs> Come here, you're going to do my, my face now. <laughs> Just do your best. I'll even give you the hat. Nobody will notice with the hat. Though. They'll just see the hat and be like, that's got to be Bill Kennedy. Uh, are we on screen here? Yeah. Well, we might have to turn these front lights off so people can see, or I gotta change the colors. So, <laughs> dude, I'm more worried about them seeing things right now. You aren't seeing. All right, I don't like. Can you guys see that? Yeah. I hate yeah. being in the dark, though. Let me let me switch this out. I promise you, we're gonna go to Zoom. But before we get to Zoom, I really want to change. Um, I want to do this again. This takes me ten minutes. References, color theme. Um, Oh. Put the lights on. Let me see if you guys can see this. Because when the lights go off, somebody's going to fall asleep. <laughs> <laughs> and let there be light. We'll get some lights up, too. Put those lights on. I'm not putting on Zoom until I get some light. <laughs> right, how do I run Zoom here? I'm in Google. I'm going to be using Chrome. Oh, we got lights on. All right. It's just, yeah, I don't want it too dark, you know? It's not good. By the way, what's good about the back of the room is really the front of the room. <laughs> now, I'm not walking around to see what you're doing on your laptops. I mean, that cat video you're watching right now is funny and all, but it's okay. Right, you can do whatever you want on there while I'm talking. By the way. Look at this. All right, how are we doing with Zoom? You know what? It would help if I had some internet. Right now. Yeah, I'm connected to it. Okay, while well, we get it set up. Oh. By the way, big pins and stickers, I want this hat filled by the end of the year. So, your companies and small ones. They just like Gojek's gone a little crazy. Like, <laughs> <laughs> they love your company. <laughs> Stay nice and small like this, okay? Small. Like Kubernetes did it right, okay? Go Jack. Kubernetes, right? <laughs> Go Jack. Kubernetes, right? right? Not so good. Please, can you send me the smaller one? Yes. Is that going to get pushed off the hat at some point? You guys understand that? I love the guys at Go Jack. You guys heard of Go Jack? 
Yeah. 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 Bunch of developers in India, you guys don't even service India. <laughs> Killing, dude. Killing. At least they finally got into Singapore. Because you know? that was a mess. Oh, we are set. Good stuff. All right. Let me see where I'm at here. Uh, do I even want that? I don't even need that. Let's see. I need, I need this, which is good. Let me set up some stuff here so we can do this better. I've got, can I minimize this? Because I don't care about that. Is that an, what's out on this screen? I am beautiful. Um, let me clean that up. That's good. Let's clear that up. That's good. Huh. And this, you guys can see this with the light that we have. Oh, wait, wait. Can you see the terminal? Do I have to change the terminal? Yeah, I gotta change the terminal. Uh, I always forget how to do this too. Uh, it's not really under appearance, I don't think. It's like, ah, uh, there we go. That's good, right? All right. It's almost like I've done this before, you know? That's pretty amazing. <laughs> All right, you guys ready to get going? Yes. I think we got everybody in the room. What are we supposed to have some food in here, Dad? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, welcome everybody. The end. <laughs> uh, I guess that's not gonna work out. Okay, so let's get going. We'll have a little. Uh, we'll have a little fun. We'll do a little live coding. We'll talk about a bunch of little things. We'll show off the language and the tooling. If you clap at the end, it's for Joe. So. Are you ready? So I decided to write a fu function one day. And what this function is going to do is find, it's going to find um, the number of times a particular topic can be found in a new speed. So what find does is it says, what do you want me to look for? And give me the collection of documents or new speeds, RSS docs, that you want me to search through. And then what we do is we wrote a sequential version of the algorithm. Now look, I always want you to write a sequential version of something first. Get that to work, okay? Get something simple. And then we can ask some other questions later. I don't know what those questions are just yet, but we will. So here's my sequential version, okay? Takes that con collection of documents. We range over each document. If you've never seen Go code before, you're going to see that you can really read this just even with me describing what's going on. So 57, we're going to range over these documents, and then what do we do? We open these documents up on line 59. We read the entire document into memory. There we are, we read it into memory. We then unmarshal it into a local data structure that we can actually work with. And then, you know, I, I use the strings package real quick to search the title and description of these news documents, looking for the topic, and every time I find it, I implement that local variable. There it is, right? There it is on the code right there, four steps, uh, a bunch of documents, and it's not a bad function, right? Everybody can read it. It's clean, all right? You can even maintain it if you wanted to. Even if you were a Java developer, you can maintain that. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> Wait, hold on. We just gotta have a little fun. And so in main, what do I do? So I'm gonna pretend right now that I have a thousand documents that I want to um, work on. I mean, I just have one right now. I don't wanna push my repo. We won't pretend it's a thousand, but I want you to understand that this isn't going to be just limited to a thousand. Maybe we want to search a million documents one day, okay? But we'll start small right now. We'll start with a thousand. That's reasonable, should run reasonably, and we can get a sense if you can handle a million after that point, right? I'm always about writing a piece of code, getting it to work, refactoring for readability, and asking the next question. We don't have to try to get everything done the first time. In fact, what I want to do is instill this attitude in you. If I asked all of you to write a blog post today, and I said, give me that blog post when you're done, all of you would come to me and say, Bill, this is a raw draft. All of you would say that out of fear that I might think that this thing is supposed to be perfect, but it's impossible for that draft, that first draft of your blog post to be perfect. Do we all agree? Yes. So for now on, when you're writing code, everything is a draft. Because when we use the word draft, you have permission to not be 
perfect. <laughs> because code can't be perfect anyway, can it? At some point, your draft is what? Done and ready to be published. So from now on, when we write code, what do we write it? Drafts. Everything is a draft. And we constantly react to the draft until it's ready to go. Because nothing's perfect. I've just given you permission not to be perfect. Isn't that great? I've given you permission to take time to refactor the parts that need to be refactored when they need to be refactored. In all honesty, put that in your head. We really will be a tremendous amount of stress for everybody. Because you can't. So you see my first draft of code already. So today we have right now a thousand documents. The term's going to be president. And we call the find function, and we're going to get a number. So let's see what happens um, with this code when we run it. So I'm going to build it, and I'm going to use the time function to run it. And what we find out, at least on my machine right now, is that out of the thousand documents that we have, we have found the term president 7,000 times. And it took about 879, let's just round it up, 880 milliseconds for this function to run across a thousand documents. Okay, pretty cool. But let me ask you a question. This was just a thousand documents over almost you know, a little under seven seconds. A thousand. Can I clear it out so that you want to become a little bit? Now, if it is fast enough, we're done. We go home. We don't add any complexity. But if we think that maybe it's not fast enough, now what we want to do is try to find a way to make it faster. Look at CPU performance, right? I mean, those are two things we can do right out of the box. But the one thing we never do is guess. There's no reason to guess in Go. Our tooling makes that so. So instead of me guessing about why this is not necessarily fast enough, let's try to leverage some of Go's tooling, see if we can find out is there a way to make this faster. So the first thing we can do is generate a profile. And there's lots of ways in Go to generate profiles. We can do it with the testing tool, with benchmarks and things. We can do it live with endpoints from a PPROP. I'm going to use the standard library right now. It's the kind of program that starts in 2010. There's something interesting about profile. What this is going to do is push the program into the operating system. We're going to go that SIG prop. About every 10 milliseconds, Every thread in this program is going to be put on hold. We're going to collect some program counters, start it up again. But what we're trying to do is find the hot path, right? Those functions that are taking the longest. Because I don't want to guess about that. I want tooling to tell me where I should put my path. And what we're going to do is write the profile to stand it out, and then we'll defer to make sure that everything is closed. Oh, hi. I saved this file. I'm going to come back. We're going to build it. Great, now I'm gonna use time again. We're gonna trace and I'm gonna take that and redirect it to p dot out for my profile. We still got the 7,000, but notice that it ran a little bit, another 20 milliseconds or so. We know why, right? Because it's being stopped over and over there. So I'm not concerned about that right now. I'm concerned about it trying to figure out where these hot paths are. Okay, no problem. Now that we have a p dot out file, what can we do? Well, I can do go tool pprof and pass it that p.out file. Okay, I'm now in my interactive console mode. Now, Go does have a browser-based UI that they're developing or about 10. If you did want to bring that. I've been doing this for a little while. I'm pretty comfortable on the command line. So I'm gonna save it, right? The dash HTTP space colon or something. Browser comes up. All right, well, this is boring. We got to do something. All right now, what is the function that I wrote? It's called find. So, pcroft has a command called list, which takes a regular expression to filter out basically the functions that have find in it. So, I'm going to do list find. 
And here is our function right here that we wrote. And what we can see is that out of the 820 milliseconds, you can see that kind of broken down. Now, you do see two columns there. There's a flat column and a cumulative column. What flat means is that this cost, whatever it is, is due directly to that line of code. Cumulative says take any cost from this call here and all function calls down until you get to the bottom and sum them up. So what do we know right now? Out of those four lines that are showing up as cost, the call to open file is costing us the most. So if I focus on anything else, I'm really wasting my time. And all that time is cumulative. So it's not the call here that's causing the pain. There's some pain going on within the scope of that call. Okay, I'd like to know exactly how that 490 got summed up. This is where a call graph can come in pretty handy. We can get a visual view of all of the calls that were made from that point on. So why don't we do that? We can use the web command, and I can even filter the, the call graph out to just anything related to fine. Now this big little uh, call graph comes up, but you see all that red. The red is what we want to follow. So I'm going to expand this, and you can see here that main came in, and there's a big line here, 490 milliseconds, there it is. Open file, open file, no logs, just call open, and boom, there's our big box. So what do we know about all of the costs that this program is pretty much occurring right now? If I want to make this program faster, I have only one choice. I've got to buy a new machine. Now, this is only an i7. I'd love to get an i9. That being said, six cores isn't helping me right now, so I ain't going to have it. Now, is it realistic that I'm going to go out and buy a new machine right now? No, so that's not a solution. So in this one particular case, this one particular case, the profile is not really helping me figure out how to make this program faster. A lot of times the profile actually can. But the, the limiting factor of the profiler is that it can only show you what's happening. Sometimes it's not about what's happening. Sometimes it's about what's not. If we can maybe look at what's not happening, right? Maybe some form of latency or something, then maybe that's something we can do and I don't have to go and replace this machine to make this faster. So how can I get information about not just what's happening, but also what is not happening? We can trace it. So how to trace it. We can trace every single function in and out down to the microsecond. Now, a lot of data is going to be generated on a trace. So, usually about one or two seconds of the trace. Okay. Exit this. We'll come back into the code and I'll comment out my pprof. And I will use the standard library again to start and stop a trace. Okay, so we've done that. Let me go ahead and we saved it. I saved it. We'll do a go build on it again. Remember, um, okay, we were running in a, just under 900 uh, milliseconds, right? So time trace greater than t dot out. And for the most part, we got our performance back, even though we're generating all this trace data. Primarily because did the program ever have to really put our hold? No, that's true. So now I got it out of the box. So how do I view the trace? Well, we go back to the command line and we write go tool instead of pprof, I'll use trace, giving it t dot out. Boom. I, I now have a browser opened up with all of these links. Okay. Before I click on the view trace link, let's just get something straight. The view trace link is going to bring up a web application in the browser. The Go team primarily are amazing experts in two things compilers and back end development code. 
What do you think about their UI capabilities? <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought too. So, what they did was steal a tool from Chrome to help with the development of this UI. That means it only runs in Chrome. <laughs> <laughs> and since they're not UI developers, who apparently also don't do presentations, coloring is Now, there is no documentation for this tool. I've spent countless hours in airports. I've been fortunate to meet people who know more than me. And I would still gather that I only know about 10% of what I'm about to show you. But I will do my best to share with you what I know. But remember where we're going. All right, you ready? Here we go. All right. Could have been worse. I will tell you in 1.10, the colors were much darker. And somebody thought it would be pretty to go with these pastel colors. <laughs> I said that to somebody, you know what they said? Well, Bill, there's a style sheet. <laughs> really? <laughs> Did you know that I'm a back end dev? <laughs> Even when I have an HTML problem, I have to call a designer. So look at the trace that we got. I hope you guys can see it. And you can see that we've got go routines and heap information and threads and garbage collection information and system calls. We have eight props, but we can see only six. Cores on my machine. Basically, my i7 has four physical cores with two hardware threads per core hyperthreading, which allows me to run eight threads in parallel. You notice this program right now didn't even use all eight hardware threads, it only used six of them, right? All right, let's break this down just a little bit so we can understand this. Remember, what are we looking for? Something to indicate what we can change in the code to make it run faster. Now, this is always uh, interesting right in here on the heap side. Now, if you notice here, we've got a heap that's going up and down and up and down, and that, and that orange is our live heap. That's in the live heap. And it looks like, if you notice that cut down, you'll see a blue line underneath it as well. That was a garbage collection. So a garbage collection took place, and you got the live heap falls back down to zero, and then it grew again, and it went back down, if I click on the edge of that orange line, we're probably, and I click on that and bring this up. You know, this is telling me that we probably have like a four meg heap. Now, um, but it's going all the way back down to the bottom and coming back up. So basically all of the memory that we're allocating basically can be cleaned up. Basically everything we're doing is pretty transient. But we know that's true, right? Because what are we doing? We're opening up a file, we're reading it in memory, we're decoding it, we're done, we let it go. So I would expect to see that, okay? Cool. Now, if we also notice here, we had a Go routine that was running, that was running fine, all right? How do I know it's running fine? Well, I got a stack trace right here for it. So, no, well, it didn't help. So it's kind of hidden there in the bottom. But this is telling me I'm on line 75 for fine. And basically, we paused for whatever reason there while we were doing some encoding, right, on that decoder. And then we started up again. So we started up again right here. Everything's good. And then we ended up in this garbage collection. Mm. So there we are in this pretty big garbage collection, right? And if we study the garbage collection a little bit, we can see that there are some interesting pauses. I mean, look at, look at what's happening here. Within the scope of this time frame, our Go routine was running on that thread, and for about 32 microseconds, it stopped. Some other things were happening there uh, on P1, and then it starts again. And we can study a little bit of that if we wanted to. Um, but another interesting thing that's happening is during this garbage collection, our Go routine bounced from 
basically this P down to this P. And you can see that when it comes to garbage collection, there's a little bit of chaos that goes on. Remember the garbage collector is using coroutines as well. The garbage collector needs these P's as much as you need these P's. But the problem is that we get to run concurrently. We're really trying. But there are times where, you, where your go routine might want to do something that, that the garbage collector or, and says, what? Well, you know what? I'd rather you not do this right now. Like maybe it's trying to allocate some memory. And it says, you know, maybe you shouldn't really do this right now. Because if you do that right now, you know, we're going to have some problems. So sometimes we click on here and get other call stacks that are happening. I don't see much going on. We'll, we'll look at this again. You can see what's happening here, too. I can click on that. Look what's going on here. Some sweeps termination on Stop the World. But for the most part, other than these little gaps during this particular garbage collection, I mean, we're running, right? I mean, there's, there, we're running. There may be these small microseconds of, of stoppage. But for the most part, we're running concurrently with the garbage collector. And we could see that this garbage collection was a little bit longer than this particular one. But this is interesting right here. <coughs> and it's probably why this garbage collection took a little less time. You see the call to mark, uh, mark assist. Mm. What that means is that the garbage collector decided, see if I can get some information there, perfect. The garbage collector decided for whatever reason, that this go routine is gonna stop doing its work and start assisting the garbage collector in getting work done. But think about that, that's really not a bad idea. Because if I decide to pull the go routine off the thread to get a garbage collector and the go routine running, there's a context switch cost to that, isn't it? So if this go routine is at a point where, you know what, we don't really want it to move forward, but it's already on the, on the thread, why not? Have it start doing some work for us, right? Until we're at a point where it can go back and do its work. The garbage collector and the scheduler is super intelligent about what these garbage teams are doing. They make these types of decisions, try to get that garbage collection done quickly when the garbage collection can't run forever. So garbage teams may assist from time to time. It's going to help us get this thing done. At the same time, though, we are running concurrently for as long as we can. Pretty cool. Okay, we've seen some of that, but I'm looking for some reason why or how we can improve the performance of this program. You know what I noticed when I just kind of take a macro view? You notice that every time the garbage collector runs, it's using a large amount of my CPU capacity. You know why it's using almost all of my CPU capacity? Because I'm not. I mean, look, look at the Gs. We're on P0, after a couple guard collections, we need to P1, we need to P3. But if you were to assimilate all of that gene, it would be one straight line. So what is this trace kind of telling us at the end? It's not that I need a faster machine. I need to use my machine. I'm not using it. I'm only using one out of the eight hardware threads that I have to get this thing done. So if I could use all eight, then maybe I can get this thing done faster. Okay, so what can I do? Yes? Well, uh, I don't have a requirement to have a little I can use more speed on more speed. That's a whole different conversation around it. Let's not go. Let's focus right here. Look, I've taught 14 more for 10 years. I'm not going to be around this. No, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. I know, but let's not go there. Let's not go there. Focus on this right now, right? Now you're having engineering conversations that are beyond where we're at. Where are we at right now? We're trying to see, is there a way to make this thing go faster? What has the trace showed us? We're not using the full CPU capacity of our machine. So right now, the only focus we should have is let's leverage the full capacity of this machine. There's lots of ways we can do that. But I'm going to find the simplest way right now. Could the simplest way end up being the best way? No, but what am I doing all day? I'm drafting code so I can make a mistake. I could be wrong and I can refactor as I learn more. So I sit here and I think, 
okay, what's the simplest way right now, forgetting about scale for just a second, that I could get every ounce of CPU out of my machine? Well, the first question I have to ask myself is, is this function even something that can be run concurrently? And I can't even answer that question unless I know what concurrency means. <coughs> so let's define what concurrency means. I think a lot of people don't really have a, a clear understanding. Concurrency means out of order execution. That is all that it means. It means taking a series of instructions that you would normally execute one after the other, all thousand in series, and say, maybe I can execute these 10 up here first, then I can come back here and execute these, then I can execute these out of order, but after all of them are finally executed, I get the same result. Not all algorithms can be run concurrently. Think about bubble sort. Bubble sort's an algorithm where you have to constantly go through the list over and over again. If I were to use concurrency and break the list up in parts and do that, I still have to put it back together and run bubble sort all over again, right? So we have to be very smart about, is an algorithm even capable of out of order execution? Now this also has nothing to do with parallelism, all right? Parallelism means running two or more instructions at the same time. But they're closely related because you can think about this. Let's say I have a CPU bound workload. Let's say I have an algorithm like, let's take an array of a million integers and add them all up. That's a concurrent workload, right? I can break that up and add them and then take the sums and add them again. I could use concurrency there. But in the process of adding numbers, would that go routine naturally ever move into a waiting state? Is there anything about adding numbers that causes a go routine to pause? No. So if I really want to get throughput around concurrency for an algorithm like add, I can't just do that in, on a single thread, can I? I need parallelism for concurrency to give me any sort of value on a concurrent algorithm that's CPU bound. Here's where parallelism comes in, right? Sometimes to get the throughput around out of order execution, you need more threads, one thread per core. Actually, more threads per core is gonna help you because the context switch is gonna slow you down, right? Ah. But if it's an IO bound kind of work, where there could be natural pauses, now actually one thread could almost run as fast as in parallel because we're taking advantage of that stop time anyway. We're gonna keep that, C that CPU on that thread, I, you know, instead of being idle, we're gonna keep it busy. So sometimes you need concurrent, and sometimes you need parallelism to realize the full level of concurrency, CPU bound stuff. Sometimes you don't. Sometimes you don't need parallelism at all, IO bound stuff. But I want to make sure that we're very clear. Anytime we talk about concurrency, we're talking about out of order execution. So let's go back to our find. Our find is processing n number of documents. Do we care what order the documents are processed in? So therefore, out of order execution is something we can absolutely do here. The question is how do we want to implement that out of order execution? Well, you know, the simplest way would be to say, you know what? Why don't we create a Go routine for every file that we're gonna create? Let's use a fan out pattern. We'll make the scheduler worry about what order it executes in and do the work, but this would be really simple to do. Now again, I wanna execute a million files at some point, so the thought of a million Go routines kind of scares me a little bit. But I'm writing this draft of code, okay? And we're gonna see where this is. I'm not going for the end zone right now. Let's just move the ball a little bit. All right, so let's change this algorithm to use a fan out pattern just to see where we're at and see what the level of complexity is when we do that. All right, kill this. So let's go to our find function. Can everybody still see that? Good. So what's the first thing that we care about here? I need to know how many Go routines we need. And that's gonna be represented by the number of documents we have. Now, trust me, I'm still a little worried. I wanna process a million. But right now we're just gonna play with a thousand. We're gonna see where we go. And I have some orchestration that I have to do. So let's bring in a wait group. And let's add, let's add 
uh, all of the go routines that we're going to have to be worrying, right? Worry groups give us orchestration. They're going to let us throw a bunch of go routines out. And the idea is once they're all done working, then we can move on. So we could come in here and put our wait call right now in there, and that will be good. So this function can't return until all of the go routines that we're creating report that they're done. How are they going to report that they're done? Well, we haven't even created Go routines yet, so why don't we focus on that for a second? We want to create a Go routine for every document. So technically, what we want to do is use a literal function as our uh, a literal function for our function here. And we put the call Go in front of it. Go made it really easy to create all these, you know, Go routines, right? That can run uh, together. So. There it is, we're not done yet. Look, I've got problems with the return. Yay, the compiler, I love compilers. They tell me when I'm doing anything wrong. They do it nicely, boom. Now, I got some green lines here. That's my vet tool. What is my vet tool telling me? Oh, I got some closure bugs, and, and, and it's right, right? I need to pass this document in, or I'm gonna have big problems. We're only gonna be processing the same document, and that won't be good. Yay for vet. And we've done that. So I have now at least have a go routine for every document. And we're waiting for, oh wait, I'm not waiting for them to report that they're done yet, right? That was the whole thing here. Why don't we say defer wait group done? We can use our closures for the wait group variable because that's not going to change. Defer says execute this when that function returns. And this thing's going to terminate. Nice, we can do all the stuff up front. But now my orchestration in place. But if I do a code the ability to do, which I will, I'm going to notice that I still have a really nasty bug. I technically right now have a data race. You see this variable found? Technically, it's a global variable, right? I mean, how many Go routines are going to be calling plus plus on that variable at the same time? Essentially, eight. That's a data race. I can't have two go routines accessing the same memory location where one is doing a write and the other one's doing whatever else it wants to do, read through write, right? It's that write that is the problem. It's M++ plus plus the read, modify, write operation. It's the write operation. Look, all of our bugs always become, they're always mutating memory in a bad way, right? All of them. So I've got a, a data race here that i got to deal with and this probably can be solved if we use our atomic instructions because they work with a word of data. And we could just say found one. Now, this is still going to be a problem because this call wants us to use a precision based integer, which I wasn't using. So, why don't we come back here and make this an int 64? And then we'll have to do a conversion back to the return type. That should be fine. And um, there we are. I've got my data rate done. And we might think that we're done, but we're really not because I know a little bit of something around cache coherence problems. Okay, cache coherence problems can really hurt multi thread software. On a small scale, you may never experience it. But on high scale, and especially on systems where you have a lot of cores, we can come into a lot of trouble. Let me bring something up here so we can kind of just briefly talk about it so we can make some code changes um, to help it here. Um, let's see here. Boom. Guess what? This is the processor that I have inside of my machine. Even though the date here is 2013, hardware really hasn't changed much at all. And most of you probably have an i7, i5, which you really must be. You know, I have an i9, Lord, man. 12 hardware threads. <laughs> so if this algorithm isn't going to run any better right now, with more cores. So look at what we got here. This is our processor. Four cores, two hardware threads per core, an L1 and an L2 cache, and an L3 right there in main. What's important here is the following. On average, if that hardware thread needs to access data in main memory, that's going to take about 100 nanoseconds of time away from your program. Now, 100 nanoseconds of time is hard for us to comprehend. So let's put it in some real numbers. 
okay? On average, your software, that machine, should be able to execute 12 instructions per nanosecond. <clears throat> you really should be able to get to that number on average. Now do the math. What is 100 nanoseconds costing you? 1,200 instructions. So every time we got to fetch data out of main memory, that's a minimum 1,200 instructions that you're not executing that you otherwise could. Guess what? That's why the caching systems are there. Caching systems are there to reduce the 1,200 instruction loss. Because if we do it here, if this is where, where we can get data, well, it's going to be a lot less. In fact, for this particular hardware, you'd have to look at your hardware. These are kind of the numbers that we'll look at. Now, we got the 12 instructions per nanosecond because on my 3 gigahertz clock, which I have, we should really be able to execute four instructions per clock cycle. But right now, on this particular hardware that I'm showing you, it's four clock cycles of latency or 16 instructions that we use so that data is in the L1. That's the best we can do, right? L2, we're going to lose 44 instructions. L3, still fairly slow, 156. But at 100 milliseconds, guess what? We're not in this room. If every one of your access for memory is going to be 1,200 instructions, we're not here. Our goal is to make sure that data is in here when we need it and not there. Caching systems do that, prefetches do that. The point I want to make right now is look at this hardware for a second. Every core has an L1 cache, L2 cache. You know what that means to me? It means that the hardware uses value semantics. Look, here's the reality. When I run this program, I'm going to have two go routines running against each core. Right? I got eight threads. I'm going to have eight go routines running on each core. As soon as a go routine wants to do a plus plus on found, the cache line for that found value has to come into the cache. So if all eight go routines want to access this shared state found, how many copies of found am I going to have in the hardware? Technically four, because two go routines are sharing each core. I'm going to have four copies of the found variable. Am I not? Value semantics means that everything gets its own copy of the data. Every core gets its own copy of the data. So let's say the, the copy right now for found is zero. And let's say this go routine here is the first one to do an increment on its copy. This changes to one. All the other copies are what? They're, they're dirt. They're, they're no good. They're dirty. So the hardware has snooping protocols to tell the other cores, hey, if you've got this cache line, mark it dirty because it's no longer good. Which now means that the go routine here goes to do a plus plus. But that cache line is what? So what do we have to do? We've got to take the 1,200 instruction hit and bring back the new one. Plus plus. What did that just cause? Dirty. So what is our algorithm doing? It is thrashing memory and it's going to be worse with the number of cores that we have so when somebody tells me they got a 64 core machine i cringe a little bit you know what you're doing with that because <laughs> i bet you my, my four core can beat you on this algorithm and i ain't they're not thrashing memory like you're going to be thrashing it you got a lot, a lot to know about all this stuff so i have to deal with this problem i don't want to be thrashing memory so i can't have a cop of this cache line necessarily coming in and out. But how do I deal with this issue? Well, what if I was able to give every go routine its own local <coughs> counter? The cache line on one go routine stack isn't going to be the same for another. That would eliminate all of this back and forth, wouldn't it? Plus, if it's a local variable to the go routine, do I even need the atomic instruction? I can save on synchronization and all of the thrashing. Now, eventually, I do have to write it back to found, but hopefully that's going to be a lot less. In fact, we could say the following. Technically, what we could do is this. Let every go routine that we have just do this on a local counter. Just got rid of synchronization. We stopped thrashing some of that memory, at least 7,000 that we had, right? 
but I still got to get out found back and found. So why don't we do this, okay? It's not going to be perfect yet, but it's not going to be so bad. What if we move this up here and we'll create a literal function here and we'll do the atomic call at the end, right? Now, the nice thing is we're not going to do that call 7,000 times, but it's still a little scary because we're going to do it for every file. So we reduced it from 7,000 to 1,000. Not bad, not perfect. I already told you I'm a little scared of this algorithm anyway when we get to about a million, but I need something that works before we can reevaluate how to make it better. I'm liking this so far. How about you? Let's see if we still get our 7,000 out of our, and let's see if we make this thing any faster. Now, what were we running at? Just under 900 milliseconds, right, on my machine? All right, go build. Oops, go build. Good. And what are we going to do here? We're going to use our time program. We're going to run trace, and we're going to write it to t.out. Beautiful. 7,000 times, and we're down to 330. I'm just rounding numbers. Shape. Let's just say we shaved a little over 500 milliseconds off this algorithm just by using the pan out pattern. Let's take a look at the trace. Now, go to tool trace t dot out, boom, view it. All right, there we go. In fact, I got all eight procs represented here. I'm using all of my CPU art. Well, let's study this. happening at least within the scope of this part of the graph okay let's see if we can understand what's happening here now this program launched a thousand go routine as soon as you launch a go routine what state is it in a go routine could be in one of three states running runnable or waiting so what state is the go routine in as soon as we create it runnable and when a go routine is runnable the scheduler has to Deal with it. I put a decent load of it. Now, obviously, we have web services that handle 50,000 to 100,000 go routines at a time. For our purposes, I've just thrown 1,000 go routines at this problem. And you can see them all moving into this runnable state, right? I mean, we know they're not running all because they only got eight hardware threads. So we see go routines coming into this runnable state, and then they're coming down. What state do you think they're starting to fall into? Because we know they're not finished, so they're going from from right, runnable, 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 running, and then immediately moving into waiting. Somehow what we're seeing is runnable, run, wait, 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 and they're all moving into these waiting states. Because we see how long the program takes. So something's causing it to, to immediately run and wait, because you can't get into that waiting state until it finally runs. Hmm. And we see this massively large GC in the middle of that chaos. Okay. Let's see if we can understand what's happening here by opening this up just a little bit. Now, this is super interesting to me. When I open up this particular garbage collection, I see a huge number of go routines coming into existence in terms of their running state and then stopping. And if you really notice, we don't see this same pattern anywhere else. It's just right here in the beginning. Can we understand what's happening here? Well, let's do the following. Let's open this up a little wider. Lots of go routines coming into running and then being told to context switch. And that context switch is causing it to go into a waiting state. Let's open one of these up. Oh, super interesting. Look at the stack. What do you see in the second to last line right here? 
malloc GC, you know what that call is? It's a request to allocate memory on the heat. I bet you if I opened up every one of these error teams, we would see the malloc GC call. So what did these schedulers do with these forward teams? They got them running. As soon as they asked for some access to the heat, they were like, no, dude, stop. <laughs> I've got other go routines that don't need this. So instead of slowing down GC, we're going to run somebody else. And that's what happened. All of these go routines in runnable state started running. They asked for the heat, and the schedule said, stop, 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 wait, 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 wait. And all of a sudden, all 1,000 go routines got moved from runnable running to waiting. But look at all the concurrent work we're doing within the scope of this garbage collection, because we had so much work that didn't need to touch the heat, we were able to run almost this full time. So am I too concerned that the garbage collection took a long time? Maybe not, because we were able to do a lot of concurrent work, because we had it. Okay, but then when we look at the rest of these GCs, since the bulk of the go routines are now in a waiting state, they're not gonna probably be put into a running state until it's time, we see what? less go routines and less work going on. But if we opened up maybe another garbage collection, this one is super cool to me. In fact, this one was not necessarily one of the longer ones, but kind of cool. Let's go back to this one, because this one was cool. What do I see just under this go routine here? I see the word mark assist. Now, what does that mean? Here's another one right here. There's another mark assist going on here. I want to see if we can get some other information out of that. No. All right. What does this mean to me, all this mark assist that's going on? What it means is the garbage collector decided, at least in this moment in time, that this go routine currently had executing on P0. And it looks like the garbage collector said, well, dude, stop what you're doing and start helping me do some garbage collection. Because whatever it is you want to do, it's going to slow me down. Since you're slowing me down, you yeah, might as well help. Yeah. None of these garbage teams can hide, can they? Not at all. My son usually tries to run in his room when he knows I'm going to ask him for help. <laughs> Not these garbage teams. So you see a lot of mark assist going on here, right? To help us get that, that going. And then, during that mark assist, it's not the entire time it runs, so then it gets to go back and do the work that it wanted to do. So really cool scheduling going on here, right? But as I said, I don't really feel great about this. There's a lot of GC, which is not necessarily my problem, but I see a lot of, and you know, I don't like the pace, it's big. I already know what, when I throw a million files at this, it's probably not gonna scale. But Every one of these go routines requires access to the heat, doesn't it? So we know that no matter what, once the garbage collection does start, that they're going to be put on hold. So we got a bulk of a lot of concurrency going on in the beginning, but we kind of lost our ability to do that because the go routines that were in flight eventually say malloc and they're put on hold anyway. And all the other ones are already what? Wait. So let me ask you a question. Maybe it makes sense, even though this is IO bound work, because the work has to touch the heap so much. Maybe if we just throw one go routine per virtual core, we would still, we might be able to run just as fast, if not faster, because then those go routines are the only ones the scheduler has to deal with. A, they can assist in garbage collection anyway. And we'll also get some better mechanical sympathy with the hardware, because how many times do we have to call the atomic instruction? Only eight, regardless if there's a thousand files or a million. So we're not going to thrash memory as much. So basically, all of the counting really happens on the local counter. That's interesting. Maybe this is what we want to do. Just use eight go routines in this particular case because of the workload. Let's try it out. Let's change it. Okay. So we come back in here and we say, all right, this isn't going to be length docs anymore. It's going to be num CPU, the number of uh, hardware threads that I have. 
That's how many goroutines. That way those eight goroutines can always run in parallel and we're good. Okay, that's pretty cool. So that stays, that stays, that stays. Our weight stays. This is good now. This only executes um, eight times. But how am I going to feed these eight goroutines all of this work? Well, what if we took this approach? What if I create a buffer channel that could preload all of the documents that we want to process? And before we do any of this work, come in and load the entire channel up. This would eat up some memory, but if I don't have the memory constraint, what's beautiful is that the eight go routines can just feed off this channel. And again, it's concurrency, so I don't care what order it happens in. But the go routines are going to have to be told when, when to terminate. How are they going to know when to terminate? Well, couldn't we close the channel immediately? which would then mean that we could flush the channel, but as soon as there's no more data, it would signal that we're done. Beautiful. So load this thing up, we can access it concurrently, and we can also get a signal that we're done. Okay, so there we go. That's pretty cool. Now we gotta come in here and say we only want uh, G go routines, right? So there's our eight, but we still haven't figured out how to feed this. Well, guess what? What if we did this range and we'll range over our channel? Again, we don't need this anymore up here, right? We'll range over our channel where we're doing these four pieces of work. We don't need that anymore. And now what we're saying is, hey, eight go routines. Go into the four range, which is a receive operation. <laughs> flush, that, flush that channel out as fast as you can. And when you don't have any more data, the for loop will terminate. We'll add our value back to the global only eight times, and we're done. Wow, this is pretty cool. Better mechanical sympathies, less load on the scheduler. We know the work is going to hit the heap anyway. So these go routines can also participate in garbage collection, which means our garbage collection should be also much shorter. We still get to keep that small heap size. I'm pretty excited about it. Let's see how it runs. Go build. Time. Oops, man, I did that bad. Here we go. Time that greater than t dot out. Dude, we just saved like another almost 40 milliseconds off this thing, man. With only a thousand files, I am feeling brilliant right now about a million, right? Pretty good. I said we're gonna file hand this. We'll deal with that tomorrow, okay? Um, let's look at the trace. Let's look at the trace. Let's look at the trace. All right, go, tool, trace, t dot out. There we are. View it. Show me something here. Hey. I like what I see, man. We're still using the full capacity of our CPU, but look at my GCs. How thin are they? And I, they're at a nice pace too, isn't it? It's making me feel much better. I don't have these first. My go routines are even. Everything's kind of running at a very nice pace, consistent all the way through. It's probably why we saved some time there, even with the mechanical sympathies. And Look at these beautiful long time slices that these proteins are doing more work over time. And even inside the GC, we see that we've got some concurrency going in it. We have that mark assist, which we expected, but I feel really good about this. I feel super good about this. Okay. So we've sped this thing up as much as I can. So far, right? But you know what would be a bummer if we stopped right now? Because even though we've got an algorithm that we feel like is fast enough to level of complexity we can handle, wouldn't it be a bummer if even though we're running at 300 milliseconds, 
Wouldn't it be a bummer if one or two of those files was costing us 50 to 100 milliseconds of our time? Like, that would be really bad, wouldn't it? Is this trace letting us know that there's a, a file out there that's possibly really a culprit that could take us out to 50 mil, um, you know, milliseconds if we could fix a couple of files that are causing us pain? Would you like to know that? In 1.11, they gave us the ability, the concept of tasks and regions. So why don't we enhance this trace by breaking it down by file? That would be pretty cool, wouldn't it? Yeah. Let's do that. Now, since we want to break this down by file, and we're right here before we uh, work on it, what we can do is say, okay, from the trace package, Give me a new task. This is gonna require a parent context. So we'll use the background and we need to give this task a name. So why don't we give it the name of the file? Now new task returns two things, the context and a task, brilliant. And now that we have a task and a context, what we can now do is use the other API that's new to the trace package called start region. Start region, we'll take that context that we got from the trace so everything is tied together. And then we have to just give it a name. Why don't we call this the open file region? We're gonna get a region back. And now what we can do is take that region variable and end the region. So not only am I gonna have a task per file, I'm gonna break down every one of these regions of code so we can also look at how it's working. Now, I've got that region. So let me do this as well. Let's put this in here. Let me do this. Let's call this the read all. Let's come in here. Let me put it here. Oops, come on, Mr. Kennedy. Boom. Let's uh, end it. Let's call this the unmarshal region. And let's do one more. We'll call this the search region. We'll end it. And then we'll end that task, boom. Now what's nice about these tasks and regions is they will not cause you a performance problem. You can use it in the code. The bulk of the code behind it only executes when you're running a trace. You can keep this in the production code, and if you're having a server that's having a problem and you want to suddenly get a, a one or two second trace, you can ask for it and it will kick in. Don't like be panicking like, oh man, I gotta put this in and out every time I want to use it. No, no, leave it there. They've made sure that the impact is, is minimal, if, if, if almost insignificant. All right, let's see what we can do with this. So I'm gonna kill this one more time. We're gonna build it one more time. And I'm gonna run it again. Time, trace, greater than t.out. Notice that our performance really didn't change, right? Even with that code executing. So imagine when we're not running a trace. It's not a big deal. Okay, let's go look at it. Go, tool, trace, t.out. Boom. Now, I want you to look here. You see down here where it says user-defined tasks and user-defined regions? All right, I'm gonna click on the user-defined task. Here we go. What do you notice? An amazing UI, an HTML table. Besides <laughs> <laughs> amazing front-end dev, aren't they? They can do it all, man. They can do this all. <laughs> but here we are, I've got an HTML table with a row for each file and i know two things how long that code took and i also know information around garbage collection so now what can i do i can go around and look at whoa that took 600 right 600 uh, 6 microseconds with a very long gc now it's the same file but imagine we had multiple files we could find an outlier we could say let me find out what was going on here now if you have the file name as a trace ID in your log, you know, with time is read, you can go back to your log now too, right? Look at your logging around the same time. We could see that this, the way this was broken down and how much of a GC we had there, which was ridiculous. And then what I can do is click here and get into the trace a little bit more. There it is. So now I could maybe find a file or two 
that really is the bulk of my problem. Go in, maybe write some extra benchmarks, clean whatever that file does. And now we're, we're getting our performance back from the, from the outliers, right? And anything else. Come on, this is pretty cool. Uh, let's show this stuff off. This is what makes so special. And, you know, I have a lot of experience. Most of the software development, I have a lot of experience. So we saw the code there, and we're going to lose it as well. But to get to that level, right, with a little bit of work and knowledge, it still is, I, I could never lose that fast when you compare it to the side and any other language. Right? Just, there's no way. It's really cool stuff. I hope you guys enjoyed that little demo there, man. I see a bunch of stuff you want to do with training. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool, right? Lovely. Fortunately, I'm going to retire in five years. I'm going to find me on a boat in Miami. Right? <laughs> you guys make it to Miami? You, you, you got to like just tweet that out to me on a DM, right? I'll take you around South Beach, dude. Right? I'll let you see some alligators. <laughs> Not crocodiles, man. Alligators. We get close to an alligator. Crocodiles is wrong. Wrong. All right, guys, thank you for all coming out. I know how you're out. Thank you. Questions? Questions? Guys, me, me, we're going to have a meal or something after this? <laughs> you can ask me questions on the side. I hate questions. All right. Okay, Van, man, you got to close this thing up, dude. You are Google. At Google. Yeah. All right, one question, man. We'll see how it goes. I'm not sure we can sit here and come up with better optimization, except I'm going to ask you something. You work for me. You say, Bill, I think I've got a way to make it run faster. You know what I say to you? I'm going to give you a data prototype. You prototype. Let's say you even shave 10 milliseconds off. We have to have another engineering conversation after that. How much more complex is your version for that 10 milliseconds than mine? And if the reality is that the complexity is too much, I'm going to say, you know what? I'm glad we looked at it, but I'll live with the extra 10 milliseconds because everybody here can maintain this. So I don't want you to go after the fastest. If your goal is always, I want this to be the fastest it can be, start learning Rust. <laughs> I'm, and I'm excited about Rust. I just wish I could understand the syntax. <laughs> Your thing is on my highest priorities performance. This is not the language you should learn. We're looking for the least amount of complexity that gives us code that is fast enough. Okay? Look, the average developer on your team should be able to comprehend all of the code that your team is writing and should know where all that code is should be able to fix it. The average developer on your team can't do it, and somebody on your team is writing code that is too clever for that team. You have a responsibility to bring it back down. It's not about you showing off. It's about making sure we have code that what? Can be maintained for a very long time. I found out last month that I have a piece of, I have a code that I wrote, a code I wrote 20 years ago that's still in production. I almost fell off the bar stool. <laughs> in 20 years, it's still running and being maintained. Like that's, well, I don't know, it's crazy 20 years, right? But that's got to be your goal, man. So I, don't, I, I love the question, but I, I don't want that attitude coming in. I want the opposite. Was this fast enough? Could you maintain it? Is it easy? We're done. It's a hard thing to do because you know why it's a hard thing to do? Is we spent 15 years in this industry putting people on a pedestal that come up here and go, look, I just shaved 10 milliseconds off this thing. And we all go, well, I'm not worthy. <laughs> you know what? I want to put people on the stage and say, look how easy this was and clean, and it wasn't the fastest thing, but everybody in this room, I'm not worthy. So those are the people that we can't be worthy. That's got to be your attitude. Or we're going to have real problems 
continuing you know, in the future. All right. All right, good. This room is so quiet, man. <laughs> oh, man. All right. All right, so I don't know what's next. What's next, man? Uh, well, in case anyone has more questions for me, but also at Harsh. Well, I just wanted to make sure, like, if you wanted to go to dinner, can we go to dinner now? <laughs> <laughs>